Hi, and welcome to the History of Landscape Architecture, Part 2. I'm Kristen Forrest. I'm a public garden professional, landscape architecture instructor, author, and consultant. So we'll pick up where we left off in Part 1 with the 1970s and bring you up to the present and the future story, too. And I'd like to remind you that this lecture is intended to be an introduction, just a taste. There are so many important works and practitioners that time prevented me from being able to include. I hope this makes you curious to learn more. I'll give you some suggestions for doing just that at the end. So I'd like to lead with this quote. Ian McCarg's influential, well, in fact, revolutionary 1969 book, Design with Nature, focused landscape architecture students' attention on what was a relatively new idea, that we shape the earth best when we plan and design with careful regard to both the ecology and the character of the landscape. Listen to nature because nature will not fail you. It's no longer about just the flashiest plants, the most opulent design, or the fanciest stonework. It's an urgent inquiry into what the human-made landscape is contributing to the health of the natural one and coming full circle back to the human one. We'll talk more about this book later in the lecture. So I'm going to be talking in this session about how we got from 1970 to the present, a few key figures and projects, impacts on communities, influence of public participation and place-based planning, and how landscape architecture can address historic inequity and the climate crisis. And I'd just like to say here that I, I think this profession is really interesting because of landscape architects, just like many other designers in the modern age, are having to regularly engage with what are commonly called wicked problems. And I mean wicked not in the traditional sense of evil, but in the other definition of the word, which you may or may not know. A wicked problem is one that's defined as difficult or thorny due to incomplete and constantly changing information, and it has requirements that are hard to recognize. So problems like urban overcrowding, climate change, historical inequity and green space access are all wicked problems. We expect our spatial designers to not only be able to help our societies conquer wicked problems through creating functional and effective spaces, but we also want them to create works of sublime beauty that are a pleasure for people to occupy and use. So with that, let's explore how that's happening in landscape architecture now. So by now, landscape architecture has developed into several distinct branches, and bear with me while I run through these. It's a little bit long, but it's very useful. So first, there's site planning. This is how to use a piece of land most efficiently for its intended purpose. Master planning, design for residences, communities, and estates are all examples of site planning. Urban design, as you already know, this is about how to plan cities and towns and their infrastructure and growth patterns, taking into consideration their natural features and limitations. This can include residential and urban design for streetscapes, public squares, transportation corridors and the like, interior landscaping and offices. Land development, that's about how to structure suburban development, taking into consideration some of the same elements as site planning. Parks and Recreation, obviously, is about designing open spaces, recreational areas for public use. This can include public gardens, therapeutic gardens, arboretums, landscape art, zoos, resorts, many other things. Ecological and environmental planning, it's designing public areas using existing natural spaces and elements with the least amount of modification. So this could include green spaces, ecological design, coastal developments, and natural parks. Finally, heritage conservation. This recognizes, protects, and restores historic lands. Habit restoration, historic preservation, conservation planning are all types of heritage conservation in landscape architecture. Landscape architects work at all scales, including small-scale private residential gardens like this one. And they also collaborate at other scales with other design professionals like urban planners and architects in the creation of livable, multimodal complete streets, public squares, and other kinds of shared spaces or on the reuse and reimagining of waterfront plazas like this one. I'm sure you're aware in many cities, particularly in the US, but also around the world, urban waterfronts have been neglected or abused by industry and highway infrastructure. Our cities have for centuries turned away from them. Now in the last few decades, they've come to represent the most valuable space and the best opportunity for growth and change for the next century. There's significant pressure to improve the performance of these spaces as public green spaces with real measurable outcomes. And landscape architects are especially positioned to achieve these outcomes, often working in tandem with architects, urban planners, or other spatial professionals. 
Landscape architecture also includes the creation of public parks that celebrate cultural identity and history or memorialize collective suffering. Like this one, for example, for the Japanese American community of Portland, it elaborates on the community's triumph as an immigrant group that found success in a new country, but also a group that was singled out and incarcerated as U.S. citizens during the Second World War. It also starts to become more common for landscape architects to engage with communities on projects that they once would have thought were not really worthy of their attention, like community gardens and urban agriculture. Creating opportunities for communities to connect and grow over a shared garden has become a recognized and laudable goal in the profession. And having concluded this overview, we'll continue on to chapter two, where we're going to look at the continuing influence of landscape architecture modernism.